So let's get into the juicy stuff. <laughs> this uh, leadership race that's going on here in Manitoba. Yeah, oy vey. Uh, what's the effect you think that's having on, on Manitoba politics, this race, this unusual race? Uh, Richard's going to contemplate. Do you do you want to start with Agnes? Go Steve. Go Steve. Steve, Steve you go. <coughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, What's the question? How is it affecting? Well, how, how is this leadership race affecting Manitoba politics? And can you actually have Manitoba politics in the middle of a leadership race when the premier is one of the leadership candidates? Well, why why parties like to keep this stuff private and not public is because it sends out the message to the public that we're a mess. It's a circus in here. Vote for us. <laughs> nobody nobody votes for a circus. Demand the economy. So that is why these. Every effort is made to keep these battles internal. Uh, it's exploded out into the public now. Uh, promises are being made. People are backtracking on what they've said previously. The Premier is uh, trying to send the message that he is focused on governing and not the campaign. Um, and, and people, I think, who are undecided may look at this and go, well, it, this doesn't seem like they're managing anything, let alone the province. And that may be an unfair characterization, but if, if you have this internal dispute, uh, that gives people pause to trust you with managing the problems. Uh, Richard, go ahead. I have a lot to say on this, but... Um, <laughs> it's a surprise, actually, from yeah. Richard. <laughs> uh, I guess tomorrow, tomorrow or Wednesday, we'll get the annual, uh, this is how much we're spending on public, uh, public schools announcement. You know, there are certain things in government that have to go on no matter what, and one of them is uh, is notifying school divisions uh, what they're going to be getting, and um, and then I gather there's going to be some special funding announced as, in this as well. So that business of government continues, um, but w one quick story here, uh, and this has not happened to um, in my, uh, we do a little thing with the Premier um, on Wednesday mornings called Breakfast with the Premier. And that started uh, back in the Dewar days when, when Gary Dewar first became um, Premier. Uh, Gary Dewar, to my recollection, never missed a Wednesday. Never missed a Wednesday. And he maybe once. Like he'd be on a holiday in Mexico and he would phone from Mexico realizing that connection and that continuity. Um, and, and the premier the premier gets it. He understands uh, you know what, what that that, um, that time slot means. Uh, late last Tuesday night, I get uh, an email basically saying the Premier can't make it Wednesday morning. And uh, I try to get to bed by about 9, 9.30. The email came in after 10. So uh, I was up at 3, well, I get up at about 3.15 in the morning now, 3.30. And uh, so I emailed back, said, well, we'll take them by the phone, by phone. Nope, not available on the phone. Which tells me a lot. Um, and, and frankly, we're contemplating whether or not we shut down breakfast with the Premier until after this is over. Like, is that fair right now to be doing this during the, during the campaign? Yeah, and, and so, you know, from the one hand on the media side, there's that. Um, on the other side, it just, it, it, I have a range of emotions on this story that I, I want to share with you um, in the next little bit here. Uh, all from just sadness to, to, to anger, um, because it, it makes our job and it makes our confidence in government and institutions a lot tougher to be able to, to kind of sell the people. Not that we're in the sales business, but it's tough standing in front of an audience and, and really saying, you know, I'm proud of this because you know there was some good journalism that went into reporting this and continuing on, but you know as far as government is concerned and what this is doing, it just tears me. Um, hmm? Steve, of course. Uh, I think I think one of the most I like I think I share a sense of sadness about how this has all gone down. And I, I think the thing that the whole NDP leadership debacle exposes is in some ways how sort of arcane and, and 
secretive and badly organized and badly uh, sort of thought out the way we are about to pick the next premier is. Um, the delegated vote system, I can't believe that it still exists. I've had arguments with this with many NDPers. I can't believe we have, we're doing a delegated uh, vote again. Um, we're not doing one member, one vote. Uh, I, I, think it's, I think the way our next premier is going to be chosen has just been, uh, there's a particular word I'm thinking of that I can't use, it's just been a, a complete mess. Yeah, really? No, I, it's got an F word in it. I won't use it. I don't want to. I'm known for it. But, yeah, shit show. I, I'll just say shit show. Yes, yes. I mean, when you got, I mean, and, uh, Steve and I were talking, we were about to watch probably the next president of the United States give a speech. And beforehand, all we did the other day was stand there and try and parse the different rules for an AGM leadership versus an actual leadership, and how are they going to do the second ballot, and how is this, like, that's ridiculous. Like, this is now ridiculous. So, and this is how we're going to choose the next premier. And I, at 12,000 people are going to do it, but not even actually 12,000 people, only two, yeah, I mean, it's, this is, this is not, this is not, this does not give me confidence in my democracy, I will say. So well, that's kind of, uh, Steve probably And they've made it even worse by changing on the weekend. Oh my god, yeah, yeah. Every, every yeah, weekend, yeah. there's a new rule. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, is it, like, this is North, like, what? I, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm shocked. completely phonics. Oh, yes. I'm going to defend the delegates as well. Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and there's a very wise man who stood up when the NDP were debating this. Gary Dewar. In 2013. <laughs> no, it's another um, uh, Who said, with delegates requiring them to go to convention, they're engaged. They're talking with the leadership candidates. They're discussing things with their colleagues. They're not sitting back on them, watching the TV going, press one for Steve Ashton, press two for Greg Salinger, press three for Teresa Oswald. <laughs> um, with a delegate system, you get, I would argue, a more informed, engaged vote. Now, the fact that there are 2,000 people picking the next premier, well, that's the Westminster parliamentary system. We elect, we elect the parties. The parties choose who the leader and the premier is. Um, the other thing I was going to say about the, the government, the original question about government and, and how is this affecting the government, we've all hinted at this in our coverage, because we don't want to name everybody in, in the back room of government. But there's been a tremendous loss of brain power in the Premier's office. Um, people have left priorities in the Planning Committee, which are some of his advisors there. Uh, other cabinet committees, cabinet itself, we have five of the most senior cabinet ministers um, leave government and have to be very quickly replaced with less experienced people. So it is having an effect on government. I'm not sure how many people are briefing the Premier now. Uh, I'm not sure how many people he is getting advice from. I don't think he's replaced everybody. Um, he's, he's, got, he's brought in a few people, but I'm told that the circle is very small. And when you have fewer people advising you and fewer people bringing ideas and, and acting as a check and balance, because any good political leader will have people who are not just yes people, they'll act as checks and balances. When you have fewer of that, that affects the way you, government, uh, you govern and the decisions you make. Uh. I totally take Steve's point about the Westminster system. The only problem with that is this is a party that has deliberately kept its membership roles very small for years and years. It was only in the last couple of the last round of a leadership campaign that we started to see new members signed up. Um, so, so the NDP, I think, for years deliberately has been a, kind of a closed system to some degree. Um, you, you would see riding associations with a couple dozen, three, four dozen members. Um, so this is not this is not sort of the grassroots deciding things. This is a very small. It's a, it's a small party, you know. Even at twelve thousand, that's a small party. Well, it, it tends to be a party that is long in the tooth and in need of renewal without really going about renewal, right? You see that I think in a lot of political parties yeah. that have been in power for quite a long time. So just a uh, real real quickly, yes, no, should Salinger step down? Yes. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm torn on that one because uh, under the NDP constitution, this can happen again next year. So does he, if he survives, does he step down every every 12 months for a, a three-month period? 
Mary Agnes, I can't answer that. Uh, should he have stepped down? I think, I think, morally, probably, yes, probably yes, except I also, part of me also admires somebody who's willing to fight. And I, you know, who, who, and whether that is born of hubris, whether it's born of anger at the, the rebel five, um, I'm, I'm okay with fight. And I, you know, if he wants to be premier, he should get to run for premier. So he should have stepped aside, interim leader, and run for the job yes. again. Well, that would have been totally. That would have been what he should have done. And I just think that, um, you know, uh, my my sense is, no matter whoever comes out of this, is uh, you know, you've got a premier who basically is saying, "I'm a premier in waiting here." Uh, you can trust me, I'm not going to you know, do any dramatic changes. If you are a new Democrat in Manitoba and you're thinking about the big picture, and I know we want to talk about this at some point, you're, you're just, you're just, you're giving it to them. You're absolutely giving it to them. Uh, so let's go there. Let's, let's go to the next step. What's the opposition doing and are they doing what they need to do as a result of the kind of mess, the tabled mess at, uh, at on Broadway? Is that the first one that's working? Good. Yes. Good. I've been waiting for this question because the answer is no. The Tories have completely failed to capitalize on the mess that the NDP are in. Um, I think many of us who talk about politics and gossip about it think that if if there was an election in three weeks, the NDP probably would win again. And I I think the Conservatives I think they're sort of trying, but they there is no even with all the people that are fractured and angry and, and, and on different sides of the fence in the NDP leadership campaign, there's still a brain trust there. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's hurting for sure, but there's kind of this cabal of strategists and, um, and, and people could, could, that can run elections and, you know, get the poll cats going and all the things that they do. There's still that core group of people. The Tories don't have that. I, I don't know who the brains behind the Conservative I think I said this last time even. There, I don't know who's, who the smart, secret Machiavellian brains are behind the Conservatives. And, and I don't see them emerging, and if you're going to get them, now's the time to get them. And uh, yeah, I, I, they have not capitalized on this at all. And they keep screwing it up. Can I just say one more thing? Pallister, sorry, sorry. The Pallister, I mean, he had a moment, he, I mean, he just keeps putting his foot in it. He has had a moment the other day to talk about uh, racism, and he said, I don't, I don't know if there, I don't think there's racism. It's not it's my perception that there's racism. Yeah, well, he was, he was, he was, he was yes, exactly. Go ahead, Richard. I disagree. Uh, <laughs> I, I think if it were held in three weeks from now, uh, you'd have a different government. And, and here's why. Um, I have talked to um, a number of current cabinet ministers and a uh, little bit of context. The whole Rebel Five movement, there was more of them. There was a lot more of them. Uh, five stood up and identified themselves as being public. Uh, others decided at the last minute that we're not going to do this publicly. You talk to some of these people off record and they will, they're resigned. They're saying, ah, you know, another 18 months, two years, that's it. They're resigned. And uh, so you talk to them about, you know, who might win uh, in March, they kind of go, ah, I don't think so. You know, they, it would take somebody or something to happen. So my point is, all Brian Pallister has to do at this point is show up, keep PST in the news, not screw up, and, and he does have the opportunity to screw up and can't, and absolutely can't. But if it were held now, I think there'd be a change of government. I think there's still, and, and we can get into this as far as the scenarios are concerned, as to who might win this thing, because there are some really good you know, democratic strategists that, given the right numbers and the right mix, they believe that they can tear Pallister down and make this a contest. But when you've got veteran cabinet ministers who are essentially mailing it in right now, that tells me a lot. That tells me that they're done. But they don't have like three months, they have a year. So that'll be the interesting, interesting part of the question. I, I think some of us are assuming, perhaps incorrectly, that 
the NDP, the brain trust of the NDP will stick around after March. And that may not be true. Depending on who wins, there, there are going to be some very bad feelings. Some of the brain trust is moving on. The resumes are out there. The appointments are being made. Uh, the brain trust, some of it has left already. Others may leave, depending on who wins. If you're in one camp, and the, the leadership race has been bitter to date, it's going to get more bitter. I don't think they're going to come out of this a unified, happy family. It'll take a while. And so they do have the machine, but the machine is split up right now, and it's not coming back together right away. So what about the liberals? Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> the, liberals, the liberals have a chance, as they've had four or five times in the last 15 years. The liberals have a chance. There's soft NDP support in the polls that have gone over to the liberal camp and parked there. So now what they have to do is they have to convince voters that Rana Bokhari can be premier. Uh, they have to convince voters that the guy delivering pizza who's running as a candidate in your riding who doesn't live there, <laughs> can be health minister. Uh, they, they have to attract good candidates. And they might. They might. This is their chance that they can do it. But when push comes to shove, you, you always see them. They've been at 20% before on a few occasions in the last 10, 15 years. They're often up at 15, 16, and then on election day, it drops. And it drops for a number of reasons. A, people look at the local candidate and go, who? Uh, B, the get out the vote machine is uh, a few cars and a van. Um, they, they don't have the machine to get supporters to the polls that the other parties do. You're being kind. <laughs> I'm being kind. Here you go, Richard. Uh, liberals will benefit if Justin Trudeau does well, right? You, you have that spillover effect. Uh, but then ultimately that will benefit the splits for the, for the conservatives in many, in many ways, for the progressive conservatives. Uh, so, you know, um, I think last time around, six months ago, I, 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 I said maybe two seats, and I, I was being told I was being kind. Um, so I, I don't see a lot changing, and again, uh, like her young person represents maybe the future of the party, but if I still, in an interview situation, I get Pallister in the room, I'm gonna ask him serious questions. I get Ashton, Selinger, uh, or Oswald in the room, I'm going to ask them serious questions. I get Rana Bukhari in the room, I do not want to be perceived on air, and I'm saying this and I'm on the record, I do not want to be perceived on air as shooting Bambi. <laughs> and the reason why I say that, and the reason why I say that, is that in our industry, if you go too hard on somebody, there will be a backlash. And I don't think she's ready for prime time in dealing with serious interviews at this point. When she is, I may change my viewpoint. But at this point, she's not. That's just the reality of it. Senior and so I'm being... Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, if you get any backlash for that, I fully support what you just said. I totally agree with you. Um, I think last time we were on uh, this panel six months ago, um, we were probably more hopeful about the Liberals. I, cer I certainly was. I don't think they've done nearly what they needed to do in the last six months to kind of be a genuine contender. They've, they've, they haven't been any candidate. They've one candidate nominated, if that, maybe. Um, that's not good enough, ever, you know. Uh, and and, and Ron Bocari just hasn't, that I've seen, hasn't really grown as sort of grown out of the bandy phase. Um, so, yeah, they're, I, yeah, I don't think they, at this point, don't look like contenders. And, and to illustrate those points somewhat, um, uh, there was an interview that Lana did with, with uh, I believe it was Larry, the Free Press, where she said uh, she was very energetic and enthused and young and vibrant, and she said, I want Manitoba to be the hub of something. Yeah. What? <laughs> that, that, that sums up the, the perception about Rand. That might change. There's time before the election. But that sums up the perception of Rana Bukhari to date. By the way, you and I went on uh, Twitter on that, and I got beaten up for taking yeah. for saying that about her. That, she, that was just a non, non-responsive and bad answer, and I got beaten up for that. That's always fun on Twitter. Uh, so, the last question for the night, then. Uh, we're talking about leadership race, and we're talking about the sort of the 
you know, the, the fact that the NDP are kind of dying or doing whatever they are, explaining themselves. Um, what is that taking us away from talking about? What are the issues that we're ignoring? Because, oh, he's got something here uh, uh, that we're ignoring because of the leadership debate and the leadership issues. Yes, I do. Go ahead. <laughs> I like going last on these things. But, go ahead. Okay. Uh, there, were, there were several news items in the fall that, uh, in the late fall, November, early December, that had this, well, had this circus not been going on, I think would have been more than, than a one day story. Uh, so here's, here's a quick rundown. Um, one, the plan to balance the budget by 2016-17 fiscal year is almost certainly out the window. Um, I don't see how they're doing it. They're using couching words like, well, that's still our goal and we aim to do it, but we're not going to do it at the expense of X, Y, and Z. So uh, the deficit, um, last we heard, was $45 million higher than expected, $402 million for this year, this fiscal year that ends in March. How you cut that down to zero in two years is um, pretty challenging. Um, another story that came out, uh, was it uh, December? Um, had this come out federally, I think it would have been a real stink. Uh, he, um, I believe it was the Tories that got a hold of uh, Freedom of Information documents that showed that two silver bullet, two, um, two emails that would have proven long ago in the Christine Melnick affair of 2012 when she invited, uh, she had staff invite immigrants down to the legislature for a show of support and stack the public galleries. Uh, an issue that was criticized by the Ombudsman is raising the specter of partisanship in the civil service. Most of you may remember there was for a year and a half there were denials that she had told civil servants to do this roundup. That magically civil servants had decided to do it by themselves without any direction on, on her part. It was later found out through an Ombudsman's investigation that she did in fact do it. And myself, two other media outlets, um, some other people, way back then, when this thing first started, filed Freedom of Information documents. And the Ombudsman reported in December that two documents that would have proven this from the beginning were withheld from the Freedom of Information package that was sent out to me, to two other media outlets, and to a couple of other recipients as well. And the Ombudsman said there was no plausible explanation as to why these two were magically missed. The two damning documents were left out, innocuous documents, were released. And that was a one-day story because we were all busy with this leadership kerfuffle erupting. And it raises questions about the people, the civil servants who are filling, uh, fulfilling freedom of information requests. Are they doing political work? This is now a, an open question. Um, steady growth, good job science. You've heard some chatter about that in recent days. Story in December, again, when this leadership Kerfuffle started uh, really going gangbusters. Story with, with documents were released that showed that these signs are going up long before any construction starts, that they're there for messaging reasons, <coughs> and that they're going up as soon as the tender is awarded. One day story. So there's been, even without the leadership stuff, this would not have been a good fall for the NDP, fall being autumn. This would not have been a good season, a couple of months, November, December, or January for the NDP, but when there's so much bad news, some of the, some of the lesser bad news gets, uh, gets lost. Um, Mary Edmonds? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Steve has a good high level list there. I would actually bring it down to a, almost like a street level. I think um, just from people that I've talked to in the community, poverty groups and housing groups and um, folks who have issues that they want to get, uh, you know, and want to try to get a meeting with a minister, that stuff's ground to a halt to some degree. And part of it is staff are completely paralyzed. What's, what staff are left on the bureaucracy and even on the policy side, they're sort of paralyzed because, I mean, I can barely keep track of who the cabinet ministers are yeah. these days because they change so often. So, and, it, and so you're seeing people with things they want to pitch the government, uh, grant requests, um, you know, uh, uh, new proposals for things. That stuff just isn't happening. So I think we're seeing the government sort of do the bare minimum that they're legislated to do, but nothing else. And uh, I think that's becoming increasingly frustrating for folks kind of on the, on the ground. 
Um, and the other thing I think we're seeing, and it's this is for me, this is one of the most interesting things in covering government, and it never gets talked about. It, it is the is the behind the scenes staff, um, and Steve touched on this a little bit earlier. All of the the the, the young people that have you know, gone to law school instead, or have, you know, um, gone to work for the feds, or left the province, or done other stuff um, outside of government, who have sort of left government, not just at the province, but also at City Hall. I think we, we saw, we've seen at City Hall this, just really this incredible erosion of quality city staff, who just, they've just, they're, they're just refugees now, they've gone somewhere else, and we've seen that in the last, even before the leadership stuff happened, we, we were seeing a lot of really talented folks leave the province, and that has just escalated. I think, and in, 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 in not just permanently, people are on leave. They're taking all their holidays to work on the, so stuff just isn't getting done. Um, so, so it's yeah, it's high level stuff, but it's all. I mean, we don't have an we still don't have an ombudsman, really. You know, we don't have an AG. Yeah, yeah. So we're, there's there's stuff that like we're. You know, we're not, we're not exactly functioning right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, we are, but we're not in, in that sense. And that gets back to, you know, my range of emotions here. And yeah, I haven't had any nap today. But, um, you know, uh, part of me way back when, before I went into journalism, was on the public men's side. And I was looking at, at doing some of that. So, you, you know, you wear that hat, and, and I've gotten to know um, people that went on and worked in the civil service here in Manitoba and in Ottawa. And, and I guess part of what I have to say is a lament for, um, for government because, you know, we, I, I, I think the three of us generally are, are pretty good at what we do and understand the public policy process and defend it. And sometimes we'll struggle with, with our bosses, our editors, to, to get political news on the news, right? And, and, you know, in an ever-increasing cynical public, um, you know, I look at the research and the research says, well, you know, politics doesn't resonate the way it did, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. And you have to, you have to tell the stories of politics in a different way for it to resonate with the mass audience. You know, this, this audience is, is glued to this stuff, but we, you know, we're geeks in many ways, aren't we? Um, so I look at that and look at what's gone on the last six months and, and, and it's a lament because um, a lot of good people have been affected by it, um, but it just fuels into that cynicism that we all have, that the public has in, in politics in general. And, and I, part of it just wants, I just want to scream sometimes because there are a lot of good people doing a lot of good work trying to kind of, you know, move things and then you see some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes and you go, man, I wish I had you know, a few weeks to work on that story because I'd love to be able to expose this or I'd love to have, have it that Manitoba is such a small province. We'll talk to a lot of people off record. You ask them to go on record and it's just like, no, I'll lose my job. And there have been some people that have lost their job in the last several months and that's, that's really too bad. And that's, that's what makes me frustrated slash angry slash sad about it. Because, like I said, there are a lot of good people trying to do a lot of good work. And they're not necessarily political in that sense. But they've just found that they just can't, they can't do it as well as they used to. So. I think that brings us then to our conclusion of our questions as they wound up. Does anybody want to add anything, any burning thoughts that we have to bring out? No. We're going to the yellow dog afterwards, if anyone wants to join us. <laughs> not, that, not that journalists ever drink. Not that. Absolutely not.